The National Broadcasting Company presents transcribed Sir Lawrence Olivier as your narrator and in the role of Scrooge in Charles Dickens' immortal story, A Christmas Carol. Olivier. Over a hundred years ago, in December 1843, Charles Dickens wrote this story. Since then, each year, countless millions have listened to or read what has become the world's most famous Christmas tale. The London from which I speak to you today differs in many ways, but in many other ways is much the same as the town Charles Dickens wrote about and loved so well. It still has its rain and fog, its sudden sharp spells of bright, frosty weather, its warm, lovable people, and above all, its spirit. That spirit immortalized forever as a Dickens Christmas. Listen then in a moment to his tale, A Christmas Carol. <laughs> was dead to begin with, dead as a doornail. There was no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial had been signed by Scrooge himself, and his name was good for anything that he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. But first, let me tell you about Scrooge himself. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand of the grindstones he was. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek and stiffened his gait. He iced the office of his counting house in the hot days and he certainly didn't thaw it one degree at Christmas. Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Don't be angry, Uncle. Tomorrow is Christmas Day. Come and dine with now, us. I'll see you far enough. Good afternoon. But why not? We've never had any quarrel, to which I've been a party. Good afternoon. Well, you'll be very welcome. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Ah, good afternoon. <laughs> Scrooge's nephew found his Christmas greetings cordially returned by Scrooge's clerk, Bob Cratchit. Even though he was freezing to death in his unheated corner of the office and earned only 15 shillings a week. In showing the young man out, however, Bob Cratchit let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen and greeted Scrooge in a friendly way. Ah, this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, we like to make some provision for the poor and destitute. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? Oh, yes, indeed. But, uh, but many can't go there. And uh, many would rather die. If they'd rather die, then they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh. Good afternoon. Oh. <laughs> That was the way that Scrooge felt on Christmas Eve. At length, the hour of shutting up his counting house arrived. With an ill will, he dismounted from his stool and tacitly admitted the fact to his clerk, Bob Cratchit. You want the day off tomorrow, I suppose. If uh, quite convenient, It's sir. not convenient, and it is not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, it's only once a year, sir. Uh, bah! I'm bad. Scrooge went off to his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern. And having read all the newspapers, went home to his bed. His house was old and dreary, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. As he opened the door, he suddenly started, for the door knocker seemed to leer at him through the fog, and the face of the knocker had changed to the face of his one-time partner, Jacob Marley. And Jacob Marley had been dead as a doornail for seven years. Scrooge hurried up to his room and locked the door behind him. Gracious me, what's that? All the bells ringing this time of night? A 
clanking of heavy chains up the stairs, along the passage to the locked door of his room. A ghostly figure suddenly appearing through the door and standing there in front of him. No need to ask who it was. It was the ghost of Jacob Marley. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots, clasping a chain about his middle, a chain made up of cash boxes, keys, padlocks and heavy purses wrought in steel. But a Jacob Marley that was transparent. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You are, you are f f fettered. <laughs> what is that chain you bear? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard, and of my own free will I bore it. Would you know the weight and length of the chain you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this, seven Christmas Eves ago, and you have labored on it ever since. Jacob, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. Mm. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, uh, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Haunted? I think I'd rather not be, Jacob. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first one tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Oh. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. Fear and trembling, Scrooge undressed and went to bed. By the time he had fallen asleep, it was past two o'clock in the morning. When he woke, it was still pitch dark, but he heard the clock of a neighboring church distinctly striking twelve. Twelve? Midnight? What happens about? He'd slept the clock round almost twice. It was tomorrow night already, and when the clock chimed the next hour, the first of the three spirits would appear. Scrooge lay there in his bed in the dark and waited considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven. Suddenly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up in his bed, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them back. Uh, are you this, this spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Hmm. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Rise and come with me. It was a strange figure that led him out into the night, clad in his slippers, dressing gown and nightcap. A figure like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man shrunk to the side of a child. It wore a tunic of the purest white and carried a branch of fresh green holly in his hand. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light which was probably why it used in its duller moments a great extinguisher for a cap which it carried the rest of the time under its arm. Why, I, I know this place. I, I, I was a boy here. And that house there, it's where I went to school. Strange that you have forgotten it for so long. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child is still there, neglected by his friends. Is it? Is it? Is it me? It was you, but listen. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home for Christmas. Home? Yes, home for good and all. Home forever and ever. Father's so much kinder than he used to be, but home's like heaven. Last night he said you might come home and sent me in a coach to bring you, and we're to have the merriest time in all the world. My little sister, she had a large heart. Poor little sister. She died a woman and had children, I believe. One child. True. Here's your nephew. Once more, the spirit led him away. Back through the night into the city they had left. It was plain enough by the brightly lit shop windows that it was Christmas time again. They stopped before a warehouse door. Why, that's old Fezziwig's place, where I was apprenticed. And dear old Fezziwig, bless his heart, alive again. Yo ho there, Ebenezer. Dick, no more work tonight. It's Christmas Eve, young Ebenezer. 
Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Hello, clear away, my lads. Hello, Dick. Cheer up, Ebenezer. All was done in a moment. Everything moved out of the way. The floor swept and watered, the lamps trimmed, fuel heaped on the fire, and the warehouse turned into as snug and warm a ballroom as you could desire to see on a winter's night. <laughs> <laughs> A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? Why isn't it? He's only spent some three or four pounds of your mortal money. Does that deserve such praise? It isn't that spirit. He had the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service a pleasure or a toil. Oh, dear. What's the matter? Uh, nothing particular. I, I should just like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, Bob Cratchit. There is. Remove me from this place. These are the shadows of things that have been. If they are what they are, don't blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. <laughs> The flame that burned so bright upon the spirit of Christmas past was more than Scrooge could bear. Seizing the large extinguisher that it carried, Scrooge pressed it violently down upon the spirit's head. But though he pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed in an unbroken flood upon the ground. Suddenly he realized that he was back in his own bedroom. He gave the extinguisher a final squeeze, reeled across to his bed, and sank into a heavy sleep. prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together Scrooge did not need to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one he felt that he was restored to consciousness in the nick of time for the special purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention but this time he did not wait for the spectre to do it he drew back the curtains of his bed himself being prepared for almost anything Scrooge was by no means prepared for nothing he lay there trembling in the dark until he noticed the light which shone beneath the door of his sitting room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers towards the chink. Come in, my good fellow. I am the ghost of Christmas presents. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. In easy state upon his couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, which shed its light throughout the room. But what a room it has become. The walls hung with mistletoe and holly, a mighty blaze roaring up the chimney, and the floor heaped up with turkeys, geese, great joints of meat, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, and seething bowls of punch. Did it conduct me where you will? I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Then touch the rope. <laughs> mistletoe, turkeys, and plum puddings all vanished instantly, and out into the night they flew over the twinkling lights of the great city. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully as in a lofty hall, which was just as well, for in a moment they were standing there in the dining room of Scrooge's clerk, Bob Cratchit, and his family. Merry Christmas, all! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Now then, Belinda, take Tiny Tim and Martha and show them what they're going to eat for dinner. If that doesn't make their mouths water, nothing will. <laughs> <laughs> and how did little Tim behave at church, my dear? As good as gold and better. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in church no. because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day, <laughs> who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. The poor little mite, how good he is. Come along, all of you, dinner's nearly ready, I'll be bound. <laughs> <laughs> A merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. <laughs> Tiny Tim is a cripple and so very pale and sickly. Tell me if he will live. I see a vacant seat in the chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no. Oh, no, kind spirit. Say he will be spared. Why should he be? If he dies, it will decrease the surplus population. Oh. 
Now then, one and all, I give you a toast. Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. Oh, my dear, the children. And it's Christmas Day. Oh, well, for your sake and the days, then. Not for his. A Merry Christmas to him. He'll be very merry, I'll be bound. Oh, that's better, <laughs> my dear. <clears throat> to Mr. Scrooge. Oh, Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. I never knew that people could be so happy. But, Spirit, you're looking sad and old. Your hair has turned white. Oh, it is nearly midnight, when I shall die and become myself no more than a shadow. Who are those unhappy, frightened, cowering children there in rags behind you? Are they yours, Spirit? They are mankind's. Their names are ignorance and want. Beware of them, for they are vicious. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Oh. Farewell. The spirit of Christmas present had vanished. In its place there stood the last of Scrooge's three expected visitors. The ghost of Christmas yet to come. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But unlike the other spirits, this one spoke never a word. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any other spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on. Again, the scene had changed. And now Scrooge found himself in the room of death itself. A pale light rising from the outer air fell straight upon the bed and on it plundered and bereft unwatched unwept uncared for was the body of a man a filthy old sheet lay over the face and the phantom motioned to scrooge to draw it back no oh, no i dare not this is a fearful place in leaving it I shall not leave its lesson, believe me, spirit. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death. Please, I beg you, spirit. Poor little tiny Tim. You went today again, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is, but you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. Poor tiny Tim, my little, little child. Poor little tiny Tim. If only I'd known, Spectre, something tells me our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me, what man was that whom we saw there lying dead? A gravestone? Before I read the name upon it, Spectre, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of the things that may be only? You do not answer, only point. And I must read the name upon this grave. Ebenezer Scrooge. No, Spirit, no, no. Spirit, hear me. I, I'm not the man I was. I, I'll not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I'm past all hope? Good Spirit, assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by unaltered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this tome. And holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, Scrooge saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down to a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. A bright, shining morning, and the bells of the town pealing out there beyond his window. Oh, how long have I been sleeping? 
Вот же вот и это мантезительно. Эй, hey, well, what's today, my fine young fellow? Today? My Christmas day. <laughs> Christmas day? I, I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night after all. Uh, uh, hello, then. Hello. Uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street? No, of course you do, an intelligent boy. Well, do you know whether they sold the big prize turkey they had there yesterday night? It's hanging there now, mister. It is? Ah, then go and buy it. Here's a shilling. Uh, come back with the man. Half a crown for you if you have that turkey in less than five minutes. Right. <laughs> Send it to Bob Cratchit, and he shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Too big for the boy to carry it there? Well, let him take a cab. Half a crown for the cabby and another shilling for the boy in his trouble. Now, what was the name of the man who came round asking for a subscription? Well, well, I'll soon find out. And a hundred pounds for the poor when I do. No, no, no. Better make it a hundred guineas. Only anonymously. Gracious! Look at the time, and I haven't just shaved. I must hurry, or I'll be late for that wonderful dinner with nephew Fred and his wife. I'll be round there in the twinkling, and won't they be surprised when I burst in shouting, A Merry Christmas, everyone! And won't Bob Cratchit be surprised tomorrow when I'm waiting for him there at the office and raise his wages on the spot? Oh, goodness, what have I done with my life till now? Was ever such a wonderful time of the year as Christmas? Scrooge had no further need of intercourse with the spirit, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed that knowledge. May that truly be said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. <laughs> here in the studio joins with me in wishing you a very happy Christmas and in the words of Tiny Tim himself God bless us everyone